Well, if you're wondering why I mentioned television specifically, it's because Reverend Tanamoto, upon his arrival in America, was a guest on an episode of a television show called This Is Your Life. Yes. If you've never heard of it, and why would you? Man. This Is Your Life was a show where regular people were surprised on live television without warning by a retrospective of their life as told by colleagues, relatives, and friends. And it would be kind of across the board. You know what I mean? They had like... I want to say they had like Helen Keller and they mostly yeah. had her feel textures. <laughs> there was, like, a, bunch of, there was yeah. a bunch of like celebrities. Yeah, on yeah this, they'd like, have that. They'd, have, they'd like, also know, have like regular people show. too. I mean, I don't remember it, but I've seen it on YouTube. I remember the, the last living Civil War guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? They had a couple of those guys and they show up and you're like, and this is the the slave you beat. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and they were like, whoa, you know, like, something yeah. like that. Yeah. But this one was a real gotcha one. Yeah, this was an extreme gotcha. And is this this isn't the one where they had to guess which the ones they were, right? There no, wasn't three, this just is, one person. This is a, this it's one person. That, I, that is um that is the Groucho Marx show. I forget that what the fuck fun. that was called. You uh, bet your life. You bet your life. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, this is the one where they just shove a dude or a woman into mm. a television station, say, right. hey, you're on television now, and a bunch of people are going to tell you about your life. And they did this to Reverend Tanamoto 10 years after Hiroshima. That sucks. And I feel <laughs> like I don't want to well, forget, you know, forget you your life. Just give me a bunch of other people that pretend that they knew me, but it was a much different story. It's <laughs> just what they, they really thought they had something here. Yeah. And after hearing from various people, such as two Hiroshima maidens, who, of course, had to be hidden behind a screen so as to not offend the American audience. It's so much creepier. It's yeah, it To is. show people what's happening. Yeah. But they didn't want to. It's also, look at, look at what we look did. Look at what we did. Yeah. Finally, the producers brought out a guest that was, at best, in bad taste, and at worst, extraordinarily ghoulish. Because... They prep the whole beginning of this is it's the character from Ren and Stimpy, the the, the broadcaster character. It is that mm. guy. He was mm. like, "Hey there, ladies and gentlemen, brought to you." Oh, no, you might see that little name right now. That is our advertiser, Mister uh, Tani Moto. Uh, yes, we <laughs> you might not know, uh, but we have a special guest here today. So first of all, I want to know. What was Hiroshima like the day we dropped the bomb? <laughs> and he makes him go through the yeah. day. Meanwhile, the man is like, highly, he's just trying to say, you know, matter-of-factly, but basically also like, it's harrowing. It's him describing the morning yeah. of that of the bomb dropping and what his day was like, what he used to be like, mm -hmm. what his life was like. Well, they used to do uh, ingrained marketing into the show. Oh, that's what it was. So then he's just got to like look to camera and be like, Clorox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if I want to hear about Clorox right now. I think they were responsible for half this. Yeah, and so they had person after person come up, and then finally you saw the silhouette of a man behind a curtain who's reading something off a piece of paper, and you hear him say, My God, what have I done? It's Captain Robert Lewis, co-pilot of the Enola Gay. Brings him on they live camera. brought him out <laughs> this completely is by surprise <laughs> to shake Reverend Tanamoto's hand and tell the Reverend what his experience was when he dropped the bomb. I this gotta tell you, we were so scared up there because a lot of these planes didn't have seatbelts. <laughs> that is scary. I, this is fucking Hanukkah with the clan on Springer. It is. <laughs> this is horrible. The only what was his reaction? I so I watched it. We yeah. went and watched it. Yeah. He the look on his face. Because it's very similar to, I will put it, that the pilot, when he was there, his he was like rubbing the back of his head, and he was like, he looked extraordinarily not happy to be there as well. Haunted would be the word. Yes. Book the show? The State Department. Literally, the wow. host says, thanks, thank you all the help to the State Department making this all possible. <laughs> yeah. And then they came, he, he looked very upset, very like mournful, but mournful, but the look on Tani Mono's face the look on Tani Moto's face, the only way to describe it is that he looked like he was seeing a ghost. Yeah. Oh like he was wide-eyed, like, I'd be fucking... who is this man? Yeah. This man who killed everyone I know. Oh. Like, I know he was the end. He was just the end of the machine. He was the end, of the, the the, was the end yeah. of the machine. Still, he was in the plane. I mean, he was like it was like he was looking at a demon, yes. at, at, at an oni. Like, it was pure abject terror. It looked like he just, again, awkward. Like, the, yeah. the, the most awkward thing 
I have ever seen. Yeah. And I want to hear uh, what you're going to like here, sir. Is that this is actually an autographed copy of a book I wrote about dropping the bomb. Yeah, that is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but that was before those guys made money. He was just, uh, he looked extremely fucked up, though. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like an absolutely dreadful thing. But to be honest, to the producer's credit, fascinating. We're talking about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was I mean, 2023. I mean, but it also, I mean, it also shows you that American television has always been ghoulish. It's oh, always TV, been like this. Always. Always. Yes, yes always. Now, as horrendous as the Reverend Tanamoto's experiences were both in Hiroshima and on television, they paled in comparison to what was experienced by those who staffed the remaining hospitals in the city. Out of 150 doctors in Hiroshima, 65 were killed in the initial blast okay. instantly. Out of 1,780 nurses... 1,654 were dead or too badly injured to work. Mm. The largest hospital that wasn't completely destroyed was the Red Cross. And while six out of their 30 doctors were able to somewhat work with injuries, there was only one doctor who came out of the initial blast unscathed. That man was Terafumi Sasaki, one doctor for the entire city of Hiroshima. Where was he? Uh, he was in the hospital. Yeah. He was in, he was, when the bomb detonated, he was just one step beyond an open window. He was carrying a blood sample from a patient who had come into the hospital freaked out because he thought he had syphilis. Ah, well, God. that's the least of your worries now. It just happened, he just happened to be in just the right spot in the building. After the blast ripped through Dr. Sasaki's hospital, blood was everywhere, medical instruments were all over the place, broken glass covered the floors. A lot of the patients died when the ceiling fans in their rooms fell and crushed them in their beds. <laughs> it's like out of a fuck. That's a horror movie. Yeah, it's, yeah it is. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Sasaki, meanwhile, had only lost his glasses, but quickly replaced them with a pair that was Far below his prescription from a critically injured nurse. God, this is all of my going to be my new anxiety dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not being not able being to able see. to see. Everybody's bleeding and dying. The city's falling apart, and only you can save them. I'm the only person who know how veins work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you get to wake up next to your two dogs. Yeah, that's nice. Isn't that nice, you fucking American bitch. <laughs> I, I am lucky. You get to wake up to your two dogs. Comedians should be free. <laughs> Dr. Sasaki then began what was a near uninterrupted three-day shift trying to help the people of Hiroshima. Now, at first, Dr. Sasaki thought that the hospital had been the sole target of a bomb, so he got to work bandaging the thousands of injured people inside the hospital. But soon... Thousands more began wandering through the doors, and before long, the injured and dying citizens filled every hallway, laboratory, staircase, driveway, courtyard. Eventually, a veritable sea of people filled the surrounding blocks of the hospital, all of whom were clinging to the faint hope that someone would come out to help. And to mm. think that there was just hours before they were running from Godzilla. <laughs> That was the only thing that Godzilla stopped. was many years later. Godzilla was a result of the atomic bomb. Mm. I can't believe you would make such a stupid, simple mistake. It really is actually quite pathetic, the mistake that you made. <laughs> Everybody knows that Godzilla, along with King Kong, were probably babies at this time. <laughs> <laughs> in no way would they even be there. I've been thoroughly maybe dressed Godzilla down <laughs> yeah, maybe. by my co-hosts, and yeah. I will somehow continue. Yes. <laughs> well, to put it into perspective, it's estimated that 10,000 survivors made their way to Dr. Sasaki's hospital while only 600 beds were available. Oh, and man. remember, one doctor. Faced with the increasing Jeez. enormity of his task, Dr. Sasaki decided that the only thing he could truly do was to keep people from bleeding to death. He became what he described as an automation of a doctor, wiping, dabbing, bandaging, wiping, oh, dabbing, yeah. bandaging, over and over again for three days straight. Wow. Making things worse, the floors were covered in blood, yeah. vomit, sloughed off skin. Yeah, it would make it worse. And it, it would it totally makes it worse. And, and, no, yeah. and eventually decompositional fluids. Yeah, it's got yeah. so much worse that way. It's, Remember, it's, yeah. it's August. And it was a particularly hot August, no. and people were dying in the hospital by the thousands. There was nowhere to take mm. these bodies, and more importantly, there was no one to carry them off. So the dead decomposed and liquefied next to the living. By the yeah. end of it, Dr. Sasaki only took one hour of sleep during those first three days, and once he was finally forced to go home, he slept 
for 17 hours straight. But you guys will all be happy to know Winston Churchill did not miss one 3 p.m. nap. He didn't. <laughs> I because know that he needs for a fact. To be rested. I he remember that from the rested. museum. Rested. I remember yeah. that. Rested. Yeah, it was a nice nap room. Too. Oh, it was really nice. Do yeah. you think that there's, you know, you know what's going to happen now is that there's going to definitely be some commercial where they're going to go through the, the hospital fields of Hiroshima and then you're going to see one guy like half melting and stuff and he's just like hungry. <laughs> you're give yeah, you're not you when you're hungry. And then he's going to turn into Tom Papa or something. Yeah. He's going to turn into some, <laughs> oh, some like funny, funny, funny guy. Funny. Yeah. Funny yeah. guy. That's funny. Who's that shirtless guy? Tom Bert Segura. Kreischer. Maybe oh, he no. could be in it. Bert Kreischer should go help people in Hiroshima. <laughs> that would be nice. Period.